Speaking of all of this, the ultimate battle of man versus machine. New research released by Goldman Sachs suggested that AI could replace 300 million jobs worldwide. Fox Business's Lydia Hu is reporting live here in New York with the details for us. Hi, Lydia. Hey there, Jackie. Uh, you know, that's a huge sum. And here in the U.S., the economists from Goldman Sachs say we could look to see about one quarter of our work tasks automated by AI, with as many as 7 percent of U.S. workers replaced by artificial intelligence. Some professions take a look here more at risk than others. You can see administrative professionals, the legal field, architecture and engineering are among the top fields susceptible to automation. Note here, guys. These are not blue collar jobs that have fallen by the wayside in the past when we've seen periods of automation. These are white collar workers. And now some experts in the machine learning field, well, they're warning about significant changes to the workforce that could be happening soon within the next five years. Watch. The society, the way we live, the way we work could be quite different. It's not crying wolf per se. It is really wolf at the door because it is here. Now, for most workers, Goldman also says they will be helped by artificial intelligence. It says 63 percent of jobs will be complemented by artificial intelligence technology. Another 30 percent will be totally unaffected. And those 7 percent of workers that will be replaced by artificial intelligence, Goldman expects they will be able to find new jobs in this new landscape of the workforce. And as for us guys, you know, I was thinking about broadcast news. We might not be immune from these changes either. We probably fall into the category of arts, entertainment, and media for Goldman, and they think as much as much about, about 26% of our tasks could be automated. So maybe some more efficiency for us. We'll have to see. Taylor? We'll call it efficiency when Brian's replaced by a robot. Well, you, you already we'll used Google to correct me on one thing today, so <laughs> Google's taken half my job already, apparently, Lydia. Oh, no, not we need you. You're not, you're not replaceable. <laughs> Legal scares me. Yes. Yeah. Attorneys, paralegals, you know, they say anything that anything that includes scraping for information that's easily automated. So the input of data, you know, reading from websites, think about intakes from clients. That's a huge part of what can be automated and streamlined. Mm. Yeah. Lydia Hu, thank you so much. 4,000 people a year die because of toxic air. So if the mayor didn't take action, those, it, we're going to continue in that trajectory. In, in poor zone constituency, 118 people a year die. Uh, it's really, it's not, really yeah, serious. Okay. Yes, yeah. it is. It's, really, it's a serious issue. And what the mayor has done is he has allocated funding for a scra scrappage, scrappage scheme, which is over 100 million. If Paul... Uh, is serious about dealing with air pollution and saving lives, then his government would provide additional funding like they're doing with other city regions. They've provided support to uh, the West Midlands uh, in Birmingham, in Bristol, Sheffield. They're not doing that in London. Maybe some rabble rousers thinking about coming to our city tomorrow. Our message is clear and simple. Control yourselves. New York City is our home, not a playground for your misplaced anger. We are the safest large city in America because we respect the rule of law in New York City. 
And although we have no specific threats, people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is known to spread mis- misinformation and hate speech, uh, she stated she's coming to town. While you're in town, be on your best behavior. As always, we will not allow violence or vandalism of any kind. And if one is caught participating in any act of violence, they will be arrested and held accountable, no matter who you. Many countries are saying, in order to avoid this consequence of the imposition of sanctions by the United States, on the basis that you are using their currency in order to avoid the consequences of sanctions that arise from that let's walk away from the dollar and hence the the, the global discussion taking place yeah, about that and it's some of it is bilateral uh, when Russia trades with China there's no re- this reason why they must trade use dollars to exchange none and so that even India is saying the same thing. So globally, there's a discussion that is taking place to say we must find alternative means of trading among ourselves and not subject ourselves to the situation where there's one, there's one currency in the world which becomes a global reserve currency because it gives the country that is the issuer of the money, that's the United States, it gives it the power to impose its will on everybody because you are depending on the dollar. is making remarks tonight um, from his home in Florida. As far as we can tell, and what we were prepared for here is that this is basically a campaign speech in which he is repeating his same lies and allegations against his perceived enemies. It is just getting started. Um, so far, he's just giving his normal list of grievances. We don't consider that necessarily newsworthy, and there's a cost to us as a news organization of knowingly broadcasting untrue things. So uh, our deal with you is that we will monitor these remarks. If he does say anything newsworthy, we will turn them around and report on that right away. But uh, for now, just know that it's happening and we're not taking it. Lawyers representing more than 13,000 Nigerians argued at London's High Court on Tuesday that Shell is attempting to shield itself from scrutiny over pollution in Nigeria. Thousands of members of the Bile and Ogali communities are suing Shell and its Nigerian subsidiary SPDC over oil spills. Shell strongly denies any liability and argues that parts of the cases were brought too late. It also says the majority of the spills were caused by illegal third-party interference, such as pipeline sabotage and oil theft. The case, parts of which began back in 2015, has already been to the UK Supreme Court. It ruled in 2021 that there was an arguable case that Shell owed the claimants a duty of care. Knowledge without action is vanity. Action without knowledge is insanity, but wisdom without courage is a waste of time. It's fruitless. Okay, so it's time to go back to the basics. Moving forward, we have to remember that it's health that's the real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Let's rise up and against this organization of misery. I call on the Gibraltar government and the director of public health, Helen Carter, okay, to make sure that they make a public announcement that there needs to be an investigation, a suspension of all these COVID mRNA vaccines in Gibraltar. <laughs> and the real power is with us. If we work together, the real power is with the people. So let's rise up and remember, rights are only won by those that make their voices heard. Thank you very much. How much space do you need to live? Comfortably. You know, 2,000 square feet is the norm across much of America, but how about 200 square feet? Pod living is the way to go, Christy. Yeah, that's right. Peter Berkowitz says he's subletting, but it's not a typical unit. He turned a space in the living room into a personal pod. Pod living communities. But if it's really tiny and livable, that's something special. So an entire trend started. Ashley Marco is slumbering away, but she's not in her private bedroom. She's renting a pod with a whole bunch of strangers. What we're trying to do is housing in the cloud, like mobile housing, but not mobile housing like RVs. Mobile housing is you can have a home anywhere. There's no privacy allowed. I see you, you see me. He says sleeping in a bunk with no privacy is no problem. 
Hey guys, welcome to my pod. Check out this hallway of two-storied pods. Each pod was marked with a number. Storage spaces are tucked under floors. Large windows create the illusion of space. The countertops fold out, the steps double as a sofa. The bathtub is part of the living room. Because bunk beds are for kids, pods are for adults, coexist without privacy in these redesigned bunk beds that we called pods. It was a 1,200 square foot space, and I had this idea of putting 10 what we call pedestrians into the space. Take this house, crammed into a space the size of one parking spot. The width between the walls, just inches. Anything that you do here, you're on display. You have one, two, three, four, five, six eyeballs on you, and that's how the community polices itself. Um, you know, if you snore, that's a problem. We call them dinosaurs or dinosaurs. If you're a dinosaur, you're extinct from the community. It also kind of reminds me of like adult summer camp. <laughs> We very comfortably go upstairs to our pod and, you know, we come into our pod uh, with like a balcony view. You get your own pod, but you share everything else. You can put your suitcase underneath your pod. Everybody writes their name on their pods. And again, to make small spaces even smaller. Pod, what do you call it? Pedestrian. Pedestrian. Are you a pedestrian? Yeah, I am. I don't think you want to prevent innovation. You literally write your name here. You're actually a community with names, and everyone gets a pedestrian numbers. You get one plate, one fork, one knife, and one cup. You get half of a fridge shelf. This may not seem like a comfy place to sleep, but it's actually very cozy and blocks out all sunlight, which makes it easier to sleep. I hope you enjoyed this tour of the pod, and let me know if you would move into a pod. Would you stay here for eight months or longer, or would you consider it? Sure, you mentioned uh, the gun. Do we know how the, the uh, suspect got a hold of the weapon? Car burglaries. Car burglaries. <clears throat> mm. Yeah, mm. Ain't that right? All the gun laws we got in place didn't prevent it, did it? Neither will any new ones. Because here's the fact, the bad guy's gonna get a gun no matter what law you have put in place. These juveniles shouldn't even possess a handgun. But they did. And I'll go back to you, add your question. A simple burglary, as some people will say, but I don't consider anything simple when it comes to a burglary. The law allows me, I'll plaster their face up on this page, up on my page, up on media. I will hand it out if the law allows me because parents have the right to know who their kids are hanging out with and preventing this. Technology revolution is central, and it's one of the reasons why India's done so well in these last years. Mm. Because I think, you know, Prime Minister Modi has understood the importance of it, and your digital ID program, I think, I think it's one of the most important programs, I, I keep saying to people around the world, if you want to see an example of a reform that leads to real results and shows that government can work for people, look at India's digital ID program. It's been a remarkable transformation. And, you know, that's where, by the way, if you want to help some of the poorest countries in the world today, I think a lot of the poorest countries in the world, if they embrace technology in the right way with the right help, they, can, they don't have to replicate the legacy systems of developed countries. They can actually, in health, in education, and in the, in the role government plays, they can bypass all of that. So technology, yep, it's, it's got its downsides. But it's a fact, and if we understand it and we master it properly, we can make it work for people. The documents, and I've seen, there's two versions of them, I've seen both versions, and uh, they're a daily briefing document, or allegedly a daily briefing document, from the 1st of March, day 370 of Vladimir Putin's 10-day uh, special military operation. Today is day 408, so just over a month old. Right, so uh, what have we learned? So you say there are two documents here. There are two versions of it, <clears throat> and what they are are updates on the flow of Western equipment um, into the Ukrainian forces, a restructuring of the Ukrainian forces, an assessment of what's going on on the ground, an assessment of the weather and the conditions for potential counterattacks, and a number of other things. Um, one of the areas that there has clearly been changes in is an assessment of the casualties. 
um, and one document assesses um, Russian casualties to be at a certain level. Uh, there's another document that is, has almost certainly been doctored that has Russian casualties down as low as um, 17,500 dead. Now, to put that into context, um, UK Defence Intelligence a couple of weeks ago assessed Russian dead as between 40 and 60,000. The Ukrainians themselves assessed Russian dead as over 170,000 so far. Um, and the original document that's in there had a figure that um, was closer to what the UK was talking about. But we have to be wary of disinformation at the moment. You know, going back to the Second World War, disinformation, Operation Mincemeat, there are most secret documents that were uh, released by the Allies in a way that they knew that they would get to Hitler's desk. They did, and that convinced Hitler that the Allies were going to attack him through the Pas de Calais, not through Normandy. We've got the Ukrainian spring counteroffensive coming up, and it would be important to get documents out there, um, either from the Ukrainians trying to um, uh, suggest something different to the Russians, or from the Russians trying to undermine what the Ukrainians are doing. Yeah, can we have a look at the conflict as things stand at the moment? Is that going to have a lot of bearing on, on this spring offensive then? It, 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 it will have a bit of a bearing on it. There are two things that are important to the, the, the spring offensive. One is the timing of it. And this document, if accurate, will give the Russians a better understanding as when the Ukrainians have the right number of troops in, um, the right number of uh, new pieces of Western equipment in when they'll be properly trained in it. And as I said, there's an assessment on the ground because um, if the ground is hard enough for armoured manoeuvre, that, that is quite important. Uh when you've heard the news this afternoon, a couple hours ago, what did you think? Well, you know, I think um, rulings like this, and I think we've seen from the FDA and, and also from activity in Congress, that some of these rulings, there, I think we've been preparing and anticipating for there being these egregious overreaches um, by members of the judiciary appointed by a right-wing Republican Party, uh, whose goal for a very long time was to just pack these courts with partisan judges, often, uh, often underqualified or completely unqualified for, the, for their role. And so there has been thought, I believe, given to this. Senator Ron Wyden has already issued statements, uh, for example, advising what we should do in a situation like this, which I concur, which is that I believe that the Biden administration should ignore uh, this ruling. I think that we, you know, the courts have the legitimacy and they rely on the legitimacy of their rulings. And what they are currently doing is engaged in an unprecedented and dramatic erosion of the legitimacy of the courts. They, it, it is the justices themselves through the deeply partisan and unfounded nature of these rulings that are undermining their own enforcement. So you're saying the Biden administration should ignore this court, but what does that look like? What does that actually mean? You know, I think it, it, the interesting thing when it comes to a ruling is that it relies on enforcement. And it is up to the Biden administration to enforce, to choose whether or not to enforce such a ruling. But is that, do we want to live in a world where the, a government can decide to ignore a federal well, court Well, no, ruling? of course. I mean, I, I do think that this, that it raises it, a, these important questions. And I do think that when we look at, and there are uh, serious questions that the FDA and, and the Biden administration is going to have to figure out and how exactly we map this out. But- on the other hand, what we are also seeing is, it is a power grab over our courts in which the laws passed by Congress and the rules and, and policies passed by the executive branch now are going to require unanimous consent from 650 district court judges, many of which are appointed uh, with even, you know, the American Bar Association saying that they're completely unfit for the role. Last year, the Albanese government continued the Morrison government's campaign to sign away Australian sovereignty to the United Nations World Health Organization, the WHO. Despite the attempt failing, WHO's power grab is ongoing. WHO is not independent. Their owners are corporate donors who contribute most of the WHO budget. WHO's current sugar daddy is Bill Gates, who has made billions out of his investment in the same vaccines that WHO promotes. Gates bought the WHO and they now recommend his products. It is that simple. The head of the WHO is Tedros Ghebreyesus, previously health minister of a terrorist organisation called the Tigray People's Liberation Front, 
where he used international aid to buy power and punish his enemies. The regions of Ethiopia that Tedros starved for medical supplies suffered disastrous cholera epidemics in, 20, in 2006, 2009, 2011. Independent investigators found Tedros was, quote, fully complicit in the terrible suffering and dying that spread in East Africa. He's a killer. WHO is rotting from the head. Last week, Associated Press reported on the WHO sex crime scandal, where WHO staffers sexually exploited girls and women during the Congo's recent Ebola outbreak. Inhuman. At, a, at least 83 WHO staff engaged in abuse, including rape and forced abortions, with victims as young as 13. WHO refused to fire the perpetrators, using the absurd argument their, their actions didn't violate WHO's sexual exploitation practice policies because the victims were not receiving WHO aid. The raping part is OK with Tedros. This is the person who heads an organisation that many in government and academia want to elevate above the Australian parliament. One Nation rejects the UN WHO power grab and will defend Australian sovereignty. So should you all. Thank you, Senator Rob. If you need a single location to get cutting edge information and keep up with the rapidly changing world around us, tune into Grand Theft World where a forensic historian and a logic professor break down the week's news in depth and in context. There's a ton more there, so go check it out. And don't forget to get your Freedom Vault on the homepage.